it's our time. We must rise up and no longer disparage. It's our time, church, to honor our heritage. We have a savior. He gave it all on the cross. We stand beside martyrs who counted nothing as loss. They took God's mysteries, opened them up for us. Stephen, John the Baptist, Bonhoeffer, Jan Hus. Surrounded by a cloud of witnesses above, it's now our turn to model his unending love. Our mission is one we cannot confuse, nor muddy up with some trite excuse. You say you're not well versed, ready, or able. I think Moses even tried to use that fable. The time we have, it's now more urgent. If we should hear, well done, faithful servant. Yeah, church, it's our time. It's our time to confess the ways we're mangled, the sins and selfishness that have us entangled. Lust, greed, and pride, their path leads to the grave. Yet we return to our sins as if we're a slave. Can we survive in this putrid dead sea? I quote Paul, may it never be. So let's cast aside our individual leprosy and begin to leave a biblical legacy. There's a glorious prize awaiting to be won, and the way to win is to start to run. Let's lace them up and fight the good fight, become to the world both salt and light. Our life on earth is merely a vapor. Our chapter must move from pen to paper. So church, let's get to writing because it's our time. It's our time, church. We have what it takes to help the world from its slumber awake. To Jesus, we are his beautiful bride. Whom shall we fear with him on our side? We have each other. We are not alone. It's iron to iron in the combat zone. There's a promise of life full of adventure. As long as we give both talents and treasure, the workers are few, the harvest is plenty, with so many lives running on empty. Scores of people trying to cope. They've come to the end of their proverbial rope. Young eyes are wandering, looking for direction. Make sure we point them to his resurrection. The clock's ticking, we're on our dime. Hey church, rise up! It's our time. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome you um, today. Uh, just a couple of notes I'd like to bring up is uh, the prayer chain email address has changed. Um, if you are going to be part of that, email Gordon and Deb and now instead. And if you need to be added to it, email Pastor Tom. Um, I hope everybody's Easter was great. Um, I know for us it was a little bit different. Uh, Dawn and I were by ourselves, and we just end up Skyping with both of our sons. So, so I hope everybody else has went well. Um, ours is as good also. So um, thank you. Good morning, Redeemer. Good to uh, connect with you again, even though I can't see you. Uh, I hope you are remaining hopeful. Your outlook is good. We're beginning to see some glimmers of light coming, and, and that's always good. We'll just keep praying that, that uh, God will defeat and put away this what they're calling an invisible enemy. Anyway, it's good to connect with you for our Sunday message today. Um, one further announcement that uh, Al and I were just discussing a moment ago, uh, I know our whole normal way of life has been upended and disrupted, and uh, in the interest of whatever normalcy we might be able to attain, we would just invite you or encourage you uh, some of you are gifted, and you have shared that in musical abilities. Uh, some of you haven't done it since we've been together, and some of you probably are gifted and have never shared it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we would love if the, a number of people would be interested and willing 
contact me and uh, if you have, whether it's a duet or a small group or an instrumental like we've had some already, uh, let me know and we'll set up a time to get it recorded and be a part of our worship experience and that can be shared and people will be blessed by that. So uh, think about that, pray about that, and I hope you will consider that. This morning, we are going to open our service with a confession of faith. And I know that uh, all I'm going to hear is my own voice, but I'm trusting that uh, you will know these words and I invite you to uh, recite them with me uh, and certainly, if not audibly, in your heart. Uh, so I would just invite you as we, uh, we are separated physically, but we're together in spirit, aren't we? And we're going to confess our faith this morning in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I would invite you to join me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. There have been some uh, prayer requests that have come to those of you on the prayer chain uh, this past few days. Uh, we're going to lift those concerns before the Lord uh, as the body of Christ this morning, and, and uh, I would encourage you to continue to make those requests known so we can be praying. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you that uh, you haven't changed, even though our lives have. And Father, thank you that your spirit is still uniting us together and that there are no barriers to your presence in our lives. So, Lord, we lift up the concerns, the requests of those who are going through uh, trials and challenges and difficulties health-wise and otherwise. And, Lord, uh, we want to continue to pray for LeVon Cornelius' grandson, William, who's battling a, uh, a deep depression right now. This 19-year-old boy, Lord, just give him uh, the joy of the Lord. We ask, God, that you would be the, the bondage breaker because this kind of depression is certainly a bondage. Would you break through, God? Give him light, and hope, and joy. And also LaVon's granddaughter, Teresa, who's awaiting the results of a coronavirus test. God, we ask that you would... Uh, we ask for a, a clean bill on this, but if it is this virus, God, that you would protect her and allow her to go through this process uh, without serious risk to her life. And Lord, beyond Teresa's situation, there are many, and, and some of whom we know and some we don't, many we don't. God, we ask that you would be a shield over our bodies, that you would be the shield over our homes, our families, over this community. God, you can protect us, and we cry out to you in faith. Father, we ask your continued healing uh, over Marsha Cumlin. We thank you for this recent report that uh, the tumor has not grown in the last month. Lord, continue to be her sustainer and her strength and her healer. Lord, we, we pray for those who are struggling uh, with heart issues. Uh, we know there are some. Uh, difficult, Lord, to even make appointments in dealing with our health. God, carry us through this time. Lord, we lift up the Smithfield employees up in Sioux Falls, so many of whom have come down with this virus. Oh, God, be their protection and their strength. And, and God, in the midst of this, uh, turn their eyes to you if they're not there already. 
But in Lord, in, Lord, in times of hardship and stress, we know that sometimes it, it causes things of our flesh to come out and words to be spoken and attitudes to be developed that aren't from you. So God, guard our hearts as well. We ask you, God, for an extra outpouring of a spirit of love and grace toward other people, that the testimony of your goodness would go forth in the midst of a dark time. God, we pray for our missionaries around the world who are uh, struggling with this very struggle that everyone is. Uh, Lord, continue to use them as vessels of your truth and your grace. We lift up in particular, Lord, the Paul and Jonathan Abel families and, and the extended family in the passing of their father, John Abel, this past week. Uh, thank you for his faith and thank you for the victory that you give him and to all who pass into eternity with their eyes on you, Jesus. And Lord, as this world is experiencing a door doors that have been shut, economies, businesses, social gatherings, so many closed. God, in the midst of this time, we ask you like has not been done for a long time, that in the midst of all of these closings, you would be at work to open hearts to your word, to your presence, to your life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture readings this morning are first from the 16th Psalm, and I'm reading verses 5 through 11. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. Then from Paul's letter to, first letter to Timothy, chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. And then our gospel in the seventh chapter of Matthew, verses 7 through 14. Jesus is speaking. He says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask? 
So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Here ends the reading. Church, I hope in the midst of all of these weeks that are now behind us, you are still finding reasons to rejoice in your lives. You know, we can, re- we can lament the fact that churches all over the world are for the most part closed, but the far bigger news, church, is this. The tomb isn't. The tomb is not closed. And that means the narrow gate, which leads to life, has been opened wide. That's the focus of our message this morning, the narrow gate now opened wide. The implications of what this means for your life, church, now but also in eternity, the implications of that are beyond what any person, any person is able to communicate adequately. But it's my calling and my passion and my joy to try, and I hope, I pray it's yours as well, Uh, because we have eyewitness accounts of the empty tomb, of the risen Jesus to tell people about, and we have the promise from God that he will use even our feeble testimonies to plant seeds of faith in people's hearts, and we have the Holy Spirit in us and who goes before us that uh, the doors of those hearts would be opened. So what would God, what do you suppose God would speak to a person's heart? He would speak truth. He would speak life. He would continue to speak hope and purpose. He would give wisdom. He would give vision of a destiny that he wants for all of us. He would speak of an eternity which he has opened to anyone, to everyone. And what makes it all possible? The empty tomb. That's what makes it possible, the empty tomb. Now some would say, well, you know, his body being gone doesn't necessarily mean anything. It could have been taken away or moved to a different place. Animals could have gotten into the tomb. But remember what we talked about last Sunday, uh, how the religious leaders had gone to extra measures to make sure none of those things happened. We read about the secret agreement between Pilate and the chief priests to spread the lie that the guards had fallen asleep during the night and the disciples had come and stolen the body out. I mean, they spread a lie which meant if that really happened, they should have died, but Pilate said, I'll protect them. Why was it so important, church, for Jesus' enemies to spread that particular lie? because of the implications of the truth getting out. The resurrection of Jesus is validation of everything he said, of everything he taught. His resurrection means that he really is who he said he is. And if if, if he is who he said he is, he cannot lie. God cannot lie. Earlier in his public ministry, Jesus was speaking to the very people who had that private meeting with Pilate to put that lie together. This is what he told them. It's in John chapter 8. He said to them, If God were your father, keep in mind now, he's speaking to the religious leaders of Israel. If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. You can't bear it. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. 
when he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Boy, do you think that might have gotten those leaders stirred up a little bit? So Jesus identified here, didn't he, the, the devil as a murderer and a liar. And he told these leaders uh, of the spiritual life of Israel that they were listening, even though they probably didn't realize it, they were listening to the devil rather than to God. And wouldn't you know it, not too many months later, it was those same leaders who planned the arrest, who uh, made up the false charges, and who orchestrated the death of Jesus. Why? Why? Because he spoke truth. Because he spoke truth into people's lives in a way that changed them. And those religious leaders had never seen that kind of influence from anything they had ever taught. And they were jealous. And they felt threatened by Jesus. The gospel record gives us occasional glimpses into the minds of uh, the chief priests and, and the ruling council members. After Jesus, do you remember this story in, in John 11, I think? After Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, the Bible says word about him was spreading like, like wildfire. I mean, more than it had even up to that point. So this Jewish council, these same leaders, huddled together, and John 12 records their conversation. Here's what they said. The Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. That's why they were so upset. They wanted the world to go after them, but it was going after Jesus. The power of his teaching and the influence he was having on people drove those Pharisees, those priests crazy. It drove them crazy because they didn't have that kind of power over people. And they, 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 they craved that. And they wanted him dead. Now what I'm going to say next requires some understanding. You know what Ephesians chapter 6 tells us. That our, the wrestling we have in this world though it seems like it's against other people or it's against other people's ideas, in reality, God's Word in Ephesians 6 tells us that wrestle is against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So with that understanding, I'm going to say this. The efforts that are taking place even today across the nations of the earth to eliminate the idea that we can have a personal relationship with God only through Jesus Christ comes from the same sources that were influencing the hearts and minds of the religious rulers in Jerusalem in the early first century. A determination to not allow Jesus or his teaching to influence how we live our lives because it threatens our way, it threatens my way, comes from the same place today as it did then. And I can tell you, the goal behind what's happening in the earth today is to herd peoples and nations through the wide gate of which Jesus warned us and told us that it leads to destruction. So church, our understanding of what's happening needs to encompass the whole context of not just this life, but of eternity. When you make big decisions, do so in the context of what God is doing, not only today, but with an eternal plan in view. Because this world and all of its supposed wisdom is still listening 
to the one whom Jesus identified as a murderer from the beginning. And for that reason, Paul calls him, and we're talking about the devil here, Paul calls him the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4. Or John calls him in his gospel in, in chapter 12 and in chapter 14, the ruler of the world. Revelation 12, John calls him, he deceives the whole world. In his epistle, first epistle, fifth chapter, he says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And this evil one's goal is to convince as many people as he possibly can that we're better off without God in our lives. And he's whispering into the ears of, of anyone who will listen, get rid of him. Believe the lie, mortal earthling. Jesus is dead. He's a figment of the imaginations of the weak. You're the only one who can do anything about your life. Put your trust in yourself. Why let a figment of your imagination take all the joy out of your life? That voice comes from the same one who Jesus said was a murderer from the beginning and has no truth in him. Know that. Some of you might be wondering, you know, why is there a devil anyway? And, and why would he be so evil? And the answer to that question is because of what he lost. And scripture tells us that he was overcome by his own beauty. And he challenged God's authority. And the result was that he and, and every angel who sided with him was thrown out of heaven. And because he hates God, he hates everything that belongs to God, especially the people that God created in his own image. And that's why Revelation 12 gives this warning. Woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. His goal is to destroy whatever he can, that God had originally made good. In fact, one of his names, he, ha he has many in the scriptures, but one of them in the book of Revelation chapter 9 is Apollyon, and it means literally destroyer. That's one of the names of the devil. The weapon he uses to destroy is sin. 1 Corinthians 15 says, sin is the sting of death. That's his weapon, and it blinds us Sin blinds us to the truth. It makes, it makes deception look like wisdom. It closes doors in our lives, which God intended to be open. And we're going we're to look at that in a minute. But it also opens doors which God never intended for us to walk through. So God had to do something to save his creation from the power of sin and death. And that's what Good Friday and Easter Sunday are all about. That's what God was doing. Hebrews 2.14 says, Since the children, that's people of the world, share in flesh and blood, he himself, speaking of Jesus, also partook of the same flesh and blood, that through death, listen to this, this is what he was doing when he came, through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Important note on that, he who had, past tense, the power of death. You know, some years after his resurrection, Jesus appeared again to his disciple John in a vision that is recorded in the last book of your Bible, and he said these words, Jesus did, I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have, present tense, the keys of death and Hades. The devil had them, not anymore. Jesus has them. Do you understand what this means for you? Do you understand this? It means that the devil does not have the power to control your life or your eternity unless you give him that control. And he's trying to make the doorway that leads to destruction look appealing enough that you'll choose to walk through it. 
I mean, you do have a free will, after all. He knows that. He's taken advantage of that. We heard Jesus' words in Matthew 7. The gate is wide, the way is broad, that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter through it. Let's not be counted, church. Let's not be counted among the many. If people knew what was on the other side of that gate, do you think anybody would walk through it? Of course not. If they knew. But sin is a double-edged sword. On the one side, it appeals to the flesh, but on the other side, it blinds us to its consequences. Understand this, church. Since the resurrection of Jesus, the only power that the devil holds is the power of the lie, the power of deception. And that's why Jesus said in John 8, the truth will set you free. On the morning of the resurrection, some of his followers had, as we looked at last Sunday, some of his followers had gotten up early and they were headed to the tomb where Jesus had been laid, not because they were anticipating what they were about to encounter, but they were on their way to show their love, to pay their respects, to prepare the body properly for a burial in a way they hadn't had time to do a few days earlier because of the Sabbath. They thought that death had brought an end to all of their hopes, to everything that had come into their lives since they got to know Jesus. Well, that was the devil's intention. That's what he wanted to happen. But what the devil hadn't understood or intended was what Jesus' followers discovered when they got to the tomb. The stone was rolled away, as we know. The entrance to the doorway of the tomb was open. But lest you think that entrance was opened to let Jesus out, let me tell you, it wasn't. That's not the reason. Jesus didn't need to be let out. He was in his resurrected, his glorified body, no longer confined to any physical barriers, the kind of body you and I will one day have. It says if we are united in a death, we'll be united in a resurrection like his, and we'll have the kind of body he had. The entrance to the tomb was opened so that the world would see that the way to eternal life, the only way to eternal life, is through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The doorway to heaven, church, goes through the tomb, a tomb which once held his body but is now empty. He said to John, I was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. But there's something else he said. He said, and I hold the keys to death and Hades. The devil doesn't hold them anymore because death couldn't hold Jesus in the grave. The Lord wants you to know, friends, that he holds the key to every door that the devil wants you to believe is closed and locked with the key thrown away. But I remind you again, there is no truth in him. Don't forget that. Some of you have had areas of your live, lives which maybe have seemed like they've just closed to you, maybe for years, maybe decades, maybe in areas of relationships, or maybe some of you have been praying for family members to know the truth for years, and that door has seemed closed. Maybe you've been praying over uh, health issues, whether it's a physical issue or a spiritual, emotional one, or maybe uh, you've had opportunities that you once dreamed of, doors opening to them, but the vision of those opportunities has only dimmed with the passing of years. The empty tomb, church, means that all things are possible. All things are possible. I would encourage you to read through the book of Acts again if you haven't done that for a while. And, and as you do, look just with a conscious mind looking for times when it says God opened doors. You'll be amazed at what you find. And, and whether we're talking about doors for ministry or times he opened uh, a person's heart, the door to their heart to receive the truth, God is still doing that. 
you'll be amazed at how he opens doors through the power of the resurrection. And he can do the same thing to any situation in your life. During these past few weeks when so many things have been taken away from us, maybe some of you are, are realizing that you have been placing too much hope in the things of this life the way the devil wants you to see this life. You see, he wants you to hope, or he wants your hope to seek fulfillment and purpose through the things of this world. But it's empty. <laughs> Anybody who's done that long enough realizes it's empty. And the temptation is to keep hoping and to keep focusing on things that the devil tells us are going to bring us fulfillment and many are, are running that futile rat race through this life because emptiness cries out to be filled, doesn't it? Emptiness cries out to be filled. But the filling will not come from this world. It never has, never will. It won't come until a person shifts his or her focus, the focus of hope, from a lie to the truth. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's the gate. And he's not trying to fool anyone. He says the gate's narrow. And he's encouraging anyone who will listen, enter through the narrow gate. The gate is small. And the way is narrow that leads to life. There are few who find it. The devil's lie is that the gate is wide and you can all go through together. But Jesus warns us it leads to destruction. The other side of the devil's lie directly attacks the truth of what Jesus said, but the world has bought into it. The other side of, the, of his lie is that gate, the one Jesus talks about. Is and Think about how the world has bought into this. That gate is bigoted. It's exclusive, it's restrictive, it's hate-motivated. Don't buy into his lie, friends. You're going to be hearing that lie in coming years more than you've ever heard it, even up till now, trust me. Yes, the gate Jesus talks about is narrow, but it is not exclusive. Even though only one at a time can enter through it because that God deals with every person individually. Even though only one at a time can enter, there is nothing that restricts anyone from entering if they choose to enter. So why did, the, did Jesus say, few are those who find it? Because it can only be seen from a particular positioning of a human heart. When sin is in the way, it's impossible to see that gate. When sin is removed through repentance and forgiveness, the very posture of repenting, the very posture of being brought low before God, giving up our pride, giving up my way, which is really the devil's way, that posture from that low vantage point puts us in a position to see the gate that leads to life. And it's wide open, friends. It's wide open along with the tomb. And there's no power. There is no power in all of creation that can keep you out when the door of your heart is open to the risen Lord, Jesus Christ. So let's be, let's continue to be committed today. Will, can we? Will we? to be amongst the few who enter through the narrow gate. Receive the benediction. The Lord now bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you and your home and your family with his favor and pour out over you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
see you later this week. God bless you all.